Hi, this is Paul Marco, and welcome to the sixth edition, the redo sixth edition of uh, Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Now, I'm sorry we're a little late today, but we're, we're targets, and things happen, and uh, uh, we were supposed to hook up with somebody uh, named Midge Mathis, who was going to help us through a topic uh, that she knows a lot about. But we're going to go back to the original topic that we started last week, which is corruption in the courts. You know, when you have these things done to you, normally we're trained to work through the police and then take our issues to court where there's supposed to be an arbitrary, uh, not an arbitrary, but a non-partisan uh, judgment uh, made on our cases. Well, you'll find listening to this today that that's generally not the case. So we're going to talk about corruption in the courts, and the court cases and the various things that our uh, panel has been through and knows about that's going on in the court. So here's our panel. It's Millicent, Millicent, Karen, Catherine, and Ramola. Hello to all of you. Hi. Hi. Hello. Would you like, who would like to start? Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, I thought I would start with a court case that had nothing in the world to do with um, being targeted because this happened to me, and I'm 60, this happened to me when I was about 26 and I was beginning my career with, with NSA. Well, I was in a line of stopped cars on the way to work when somebody rear-ended me at highway speed. Well, it destroyed my car and it gave me permanent back damage and I sued the man. Well, the man turned out to be Air Force who worked for NSA. He hadn't been bothered to get insurance. So my insurance company nationwide basically set out to keep me from ever getting him to court because they figured if I got him to court, I would certainly win. And if I won, then I would be asking them to pay under the uninsured motorist coverage that I had. So they made sure that he never got to court. So for the next 10 years, um, they battled me to keep him out of court by having him uh, uh, submit falsified uh, documentation saying that he was in the Air Force and overseas and unable to come back for court under the Soldier Sailor Act because that basically provides that you can't bring someone to court who's on duty overseas because that's not fair. And I agree that's not fair. But the problem was that he was back and forth from NSA to Italy for his entire 20 year career. And the last day that their lawyer, and I'll have something to say about that, uh, the last day that their lawyer um, submitted files saying, oh, he's, he's overseas and he can't possibly come to court and they postponed yet again. I saw him inside NSA that day. Okay, so what had happened when I tried for about a year to get um, help with my permanently uh, damaged back. And now I'm, I'm after 10 years, I'm actually up to about 15% permanent partial disability and it had been almost 85. Um, but when I tried to get help, I found that Nationwide had gone to my doctors and threatened them and said, if you find anything wrong with her, we'll make your life a living hell. Wow. So I, uh, I did find somebody who finally uh, uh, basically said, yes, she is injured. And uh, yes, this is a permanent partial disability. Even, and when I had gone to the doctor that Nationwide des demanded that I go to, he um, had said, yes, she is injured and said the same thing. But then when he turned in a report to Nationwide, they got back to him and said, you'll never work for us again if you ever say this. You're not going to be uh, a witness in her trial. So he told my lawyer, he said, I can't, I can't back up what I what I just gave you in writing or I'll basically lose the vast majority of my clientele because I pretty much work for nationwide uh, exclusively. So they were threatening my doctors. They were threatening, they threatened their own doctor. Um, when we sued, we got a response from two very different lawyers for the guy. The guy had, or, had uh, hired his own lawyer and then nationwide hired their own lawyer to interfere and pretend as if they were this man's lawyer. So we're getting two different reactions from two different lawyers. And my lawyer at the time said, 
wait a minute, who is representing this man? And so it turns out Nationwide went to this Air Force sergeant and said, look, how would you like it if we represent you against this woman for free? Just go ahead and fire your wow. law. So he <laughs> took him up on it. He took him up on it. And they said to my lawyer, they said, we're going to make sure that this, this court case never gets to trial. You, you're suing for $500,000 permanent back damage, which at the time was customary. That's exactly what you sue for. And they said, but we'll, we'll make sure that you never get to court unless you settle with us for $5,000. We will sabotage this case. So they proceeded for the next 10 years to sabotage the case. And wow. when we did find, when I finally did get another lawyer and um, he sued and got them to court, got them to pretrial, the, the judge in it said, well, um, basically, NS, um, basically Nationwide is a big dog. They don't want to go to trial. So I'm going to order that they pay you $12,000. And if you dare challenge my decision, I'll make sure you get nothing. So at that point in time, we had to take $12,000 for a permanent back injury that I would say on a scale of one to 10 uh, was a 12 as far as pain went for the first couple of years because I had um, vertebra that were pressing on my, um, on my spine. And if you think one pinch nerve is painful, imagine how, uh, how painful millions of pinch nerves are. So that was my ordeal. And uh, I tried to get the Maryland insurance uh, uh, people uh, that oversee the insurance, uh, tried to get them involved. And one gentleman finally called me back and he said, look, the Maryland Insurance Commission is here to protect insurance companies from their clients. Don't call back, I can't help mm. you. So, yeah, so the court system was totally skewed and anti-American, uh, basically anti-victim 30 plus years ago. So I would begin with that. You know what, I would, I, I think this is a, this is a brilliant because this is such a brilliant opening because it combines um, three aspects that um, I think we'll see over and over. Because on one hand, you had um, this guy who was, um, so he was NSA or Air Force or both? I mean, I guess they're do mix. Yeah, yes, he was um, Air Force, but Air Force, Army, uh, Marines, depending on their field, they will go to NSA every so many years. You know, they, they could spend their entire career going uh, to and from NSA to other field assignments. Yeah, so... This guy, so he had um, Air Force links, he had links to NSA, um, and there they already started protecting him. And I think this is very important because one of the points I would like to bet, when we are seeing a sort of collusion, there seems to be some sort of arrangement with, with between people. They, they conspire. They conspire. It's a conspiracy theory, you know. It is a conspiracy. So it's, they conspire to cover up crimes and you know conspiring to commit fraud conspiring you know to commit homicide is a these sort of conspiracies are standard thing in most jurisdictions you know because they happen all the time it's just you just need to have two or more people agreeing to do something criminal and you already have a criminal conspiracy you know so that's that's what our entire legal system is there for you know you've got a couple of people doing something solo but the vast majority of crimes are committed with several people. So you already have this sort of conspiracy um, to commit, you know, or to pervert the course of justice between NSA, the Air Force, and one individual. And then you see the same thing with the insurance company. And, you know, for these things to just happen coincidentally is very, very difficult. So I would say what your case already shows is that there were well-established links between NSA and Air Force, which isn't surprising, but there were equally well-established links between the insurance industry and these outfits and the courts, right? That's what it shows. And that is such a wonderful opening because I can explain that in detail why that's the case. But this is just to observe from your case that you have proof already 10 years ago that there were well-established links between NSA, Air Force, the court system, 
and insurance companies. And that will, that will figure, feature main, you know, in a big time, I think, in the future. Well, it was this because I went to NSA security and I said, this man is perpetrating fraud because NSA security basically said, we're interested in anything that somebody does that's, dis that's dishonest, you know? And so I reported him to them and they said, so? I even took it to the uh, inspector general at the Pentagon and uh, basically they said, oh, well, he really pulled one off on, a, on the civilian court system, didn't he? Yeah. And that was the response. Nothing further. But in your case, actually, Karen, it almost sounds like you actually knew or you found out that they deliberately tried to sabotage the case. I mean, did they actually said to you, we will sabotage this case if you do not settle? Yes. Yes, they told that to my lawyer. She reported it to me. She said in a conversation with the, um, with the lawyer that NSA hired, you know, out of their pocket with, I mean, theoretically, that's with my money. All right. If I'm True, paying working for coverage it. and they hire a lawyer to keep me from getting the coverage I paid for, they're using my insurance payments against me. And the interesting thing is that they had done that before. And there was a, uh, there was a decision in a uh, Maryland court that says this, you can't do this. This is a conflict of interest, and that was on the books, and that decision was ignored in my case. So it's very well established. I mean, Nationwide, uh, to, to me, was one of the, and probably still is, one of the most corrupt of the insurance companies that exist. Um, in fact, when my car was destroyed, um, they, it was a Honda Accord, which is a larger size Honda, and they came back and gave me pa paperwork that said it was a Honda Civic. And I said, no, 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 you're cheating me out of two thirds of the value of the car. You've made a mistake. Oh, we, we know what we're doing. I said, no, no, go back and look at the paperwork that I've paid you for, for years on this car. And you'll see that I've paid on a Honda Accord. And at that point in time, the woman said, look, we're gonna pay you for a Honda Civic. And if you make any more noise about it, we're not gonna pay you at all. And I assume you need money for a new car. So she knew very well that she was cooking the books. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah, and I you also said that you went to, that the NSA went to the doctors and they went to the doctorate nationwide and threatened them, right? Uh, no, I mean, I, how did you find out about that? No, no, a nationwide, uh, NSA did not, nationwide did. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of my doctors basically turned very nasty on me. He was the primary doctor I was seeing. He turned very nasty on me and got in my face and was basically complaining to me and uh, as if this were my fault, saying that, nation, that Nationwide had threatened him to put him, basically to sue him and to cause him a lot of cost and a lot of trouble if he dared put down that I was permanently injured and so he essentially stopped trying to help me. Um, and he made it that the HMO that I was, that I belonged to, that nobody there would help me either. I would go try to see another orthopedic surgeon and they'd say, oh no, you're Dr. So-and-so's uh, client, I can't, I can't help you. I said, yes, but I don't want Dr. So-and-so as my doctor anymore. And they said, well, that's, that's too bad. Nobody here is gonna help you but him. So they had the HMO refuse to treat me and kept me in pain for a lot longer than I should have been. And like I said, it was a pretty horrific pain because the pain threshold was so high that the vast majority of days, you know, I would sleep maybe two hours because of the pain threshold. And if I was lucky, maybe once a week, I'd catch about four hours of sleep, but um, it was very bad. It was very bad because the, um, the spine had actually been dislocated and was pinching the, um, all the nerves in my back. But, so sorry. Um, that just you know, was so horrendous. And you've had this horrific accident and they're sort of trying to sabotage and streamline and, you know, rig things for their benefit. Instead of simply addressing what, what had really happened. Well, they didn't want their uninsured motorist coverage that I was paying for tapped into. I think in, in all of Midget, you know, we can we can look at it like normal people and say. Sorry, I've just okay. Sorry, um, 
Um, so, you know, I, I think we can look at this and think, oh, this is so horrific, and for normal people it's not understandable, but I think we should turn it around and say, what you just saw there, Karen, was already the first indications of capture, of capture by a system. You know, okay. I, I think already, you know, because the, the truth is we all come together now, all of us have tried to go to the police and to the court, and all of us have experienced some sort of horrific corruption. And now we wake up and we realize, oh my God, the entire world seems to be in deep capture by a criminal syndicate um, that goes around murdering people and mutilating them, you know? And, um, and I want to say, well, this deep capture doesn't just come like boom, like that, you know, from within a week. This has been built up over decades, if not centuries. And all of these odd things that happen, as soon as you come up against irregularities, every irregularity is an indication of capture every single one and then what you have to do is you have to make a list of who is captured because they have you know captured the system they are criminals inside the system so this means already you know 10 years ago you saw a string of criminals ever you know a, a criminal from the air force working with criminals at the nsa working with criminals in the insurance industry and given how they behaved i would also say that a good batch of them are psychopaths they don't care they really don't care because normal people would not be able to do that and i think the outcome from this is to just you know you already saw how many psychopaths accumulated in all these different fields you know in the insurance industry and nsa and the air force and air force and nsa are not that surprising because everything to do with army you know psychopaths have got a competitive advantage and the same to do with spying I would say all the people who were throwing you irregularities were actually, you know, they were um, delineating the capture um, between these organizations. Yeah. No, it was, it was incredible. I was, like I said, um, it was actually more than 10 years ago. So I, I was an innocent 26, <laughs> you know, 26, 27 years old when it happened. And I just couldn't believe how the system did not work. It just, it just didn't. Nothing about it worked the way that we were brought up to believe that the uh, justice system works. So imagine that corrupt 30 years ago. Imagine what it is now. I, I can, I've got to tell you, Midge has been in and out. Yeah. So she's able to, to do it anyway for next week. Uh, we can have her do her murder incorporated thing. Okay. Uh, hello, Midge. He's got her mic muted. Yeah. We do have people. Yeah, I think. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I think, you know, it, it's so interesting because, um, um, I mean, that in itself, you know, people don't think about it this way because people don't approach these, um, you know, these incidences and these, these tra tragedies and uh, as, as a systems analyst. But what you have, I mean, your case, Karen, is such a bombshell. You know, your, your whistleblowing case is a bombshell because it shows the deep capture um, in NSA. But this is also a bombshell because it shows the deep capture in NSA. And the, the, the really smoking gun, I mean, the, um, you know, the link between Air Force and NSA, that's not surprising. But the link between the insurance company and NSA, you know, the fact that you were an NSA employee and NSA picked sides in favor of a man who was clearly wasted because he couldn't even arrange his own car insurance. I mean, what sort of possible interest have in favoring this man over you? That is already a smoking gun. It means that that guy had something going for him that had nothing to do with his level of organization or his intellect, right? Think about it. What could he have possibly been involved in, in that he was so goddamn precious for NSA that they would, you know, pull off something like that. Well, knowing the, my first impression at the time was that he was a good old boy. Basically, NSA security looked at him as another man. He was a man in the military, so we're going to basically blow this off because of stupid woman. Who cares, you know, what happened to her? We're going to protect our own because a lot of military, uh, ex-military go into NSA security. Well, the interesting thing was yeah. that... I got nationwide insurance through GIBA, which is uh, NSA sponsored. It was uh, helping people get insurance at a special rate. 
And when I went in to speak to them, um, I spoke to a Mr. Derwin who uh, I asked him, I said, I want to put in the files a complaint about how very terribly Nationwide treated me and how they cheated me out of coverage so that anybody coming to look through this, you know, to pick out insurance would see my complaint letter. And he said, well, I'll let you write a complaint letter. He said, and I'll file it, but I'm not going to let anybody see it. I said, what? He said, no, I'm not going to let anybody see it. I'm going to put it in the file just like you requested, but I will not let anybody see it. And after he retired, gee, I wonder where he went to work. I do believe he went to the yeah. insurance uh, industry. Exactly. Exactly, Karen. And now this is the smoking gun. And this is now I'm going to just put this in because it will be relevant for, I think, everything that we'll be talking about from now on. Because we already talked about how on earth can it be that we've got this, this global Phoenix program, you know, the targeting of people globally. How on earth can this be? And I, I said, um, you know, in, in previous um, occasions that the intelligence agencies have morphed a long time ago. So forget about Five Eyes, you know, which is the UK, Canada, and the US, and Australia, and you know, what's what's the fifth one? You know, <laughs> New Zealand, um, the English-speaking country, basically. Australia. Exactly, yeah. Australia, and New Zealand. Do they count New Zealand separately? Whatever, you know what I mean. So five that's eyes. the Five Eyes. Right? But, but there are already reports, um, you know, on, on, for example, the Richie Allen show and, and many other places that, oh, it, it seems to be the case that um, a rather, you know, sounds like a kind of militant um, German intelligence agency called DVD seems to have an office in the MI6 building. Hmm. You know, how, how interesting, you know, in any sense, if you think about it, um, you know, classically, but it makes perfect sense if you think what well, these intelligence agencies have morphed a long, long time ago. And they are all part of the same entity. And all these intelligence agencies are just branch officers of the same one agency by now. And then, you know, it's also a small leap. And I can explain this in greater detail maybe in another episode. But this seems to be the case, you know. And um, this is why we have exactly the same program being run in Germany, Switzerland, you know, UK, um, in the US, the targeting is identical because different branch officers are executing the same program decided on by head office. Um, but now, so the way to look at it is that when you had your problems with NSA, you, were, you had a problem with one of these branch officers, okay? Um, but now, it's not just the intelligence agencies that fused because they have fused with many other entities. You know, you can already look at what's called the revolving door in the UK where, you know, heads of intelligence go to, you know, oil companies and banks and so on quite easily. Well, that could be just coincidence because those places pay well, a lot. But if we think about it and we think, hang on, the intelligence agencies seem to have um, morphed to the to the one agency. In banking, we have the same thing. You know, the central banks are all morphed into one. The Bank of International Settlements being the central bank of central banks. And um, in, in the finance industry, people already talk about the one bank. Okay. And it stands to reason that the one bank, if it wants to make a lot of money, it will at some point buy the one agency the one global intelligence agency and you all pay for services so banking and, and intelligence are intimately linked but if you think this is one big conspiracy theory there's one paper that nails it and this is what will bring you back to your case there's in 2011 a group of swiss mathematicians and systems analysts mapped out 43,000 global companies and they could prove that actually a massive cartel exists and they called it this structure that was interlinked. Um, they called it the network of global corporate control. And I can, we can put the link to that paper into the show notes. That is the most important paper of the 21st century, in my view, because it shows this cartel. And they mapped it out what companies belong to this cartel at the top. So all these, um, you know, from 43,000 companies, I think 40% belong to this what they call the super entity. And I think they made in terms of profit, 60% of the profit or something like that. So it was something insane. Um, but the companies that were at the top were banks and insurance companies. Okay, so if we say the banks have moved to the one bank, 
and they most likely have bought the one agency because it's so darn profitable and the one bank is also closest company it directly follows that that explains why NSA had a favored um, insurance company and that there were extremely close links between that insurance company and NSA because they were de facto owned by the same global entity you know? and everybody who doubts this can look up this paper called the network of global corporate control by Glattfelder, uh, Vitali, and I forget the other names, in, from 2011. And what you experienced, you know, in that car accident and all the shenanigans that was going on, we didn't realize it at the time, but um, the people committing irregularities mapped out the capture and mapped out the network for you. And already then, there seemed to have been a very close link between the insurance industry, NSA, the Air Force, and the, um, the judiciary thing for going forward that can already be taken not as evidence but as an indication that should we see something like that in the future you know we shouldn't be surprised and we should think maybe it's the indication of the same super cartel being at work here and I think it's significant that the judge got into the whole story the judge worked with nationwide against Karen you know, and behind the scenes apparently with NSA against Karen that yeah, and it. again, yeah, it's because it kind of shows you that you know that's how the court system appears to work. There are corrupt judges. I mean, who is at the top of the court system in, in a court? You know, the judge has so much power, right? And if the judge is captured, as you say, you know, if he's corrupt and he's essentially expressing a corrupt ideology, then that whole court system is going to be bogus, the whole system is going to not work. As oh, absolutely. To. I mean, the, the second lawyer that I finally got explained to the judge, he said they've been playing these games, they've been filing perjurious or a perjurious uh, paperwork for 10 years. The man is here working at NSA and has been for years. And you have not, basically, they've not let her get her court, her day in court for 10 years. And we all know that justice delayed is justice denied. Mm -hmm. And so he said, okay, I will hold a pretrial hearing. And then during that hearing, he basically said, take $12,000 and shut up. Yeah. Of 500,000. Of 500, for exactly. 10 years of suffering at that point, you know. Yeah. And you know what? At, um, historically, before the internet and before the advent of large databases that could hold, you know, huge amounts of information and were searchable, People left it at that and, and thought, oh, that is just, yes, another incident of corruption and the personal tragedy, but it isn't actually. What you did is you stress tested the system. Every one of these cases, I really want people and all the victims of the intelligence agencies to think about that when you're coming up against corruption, what you essentially are doing is you're debugging the system. You found the bug, you're stepping through the system and wherever you find an irregularity, it implies capture, it therefore it implies a bug in the system, you know, or a corrupt individual actually. But if it's like a computer program, it would be a bug that has to be removed to make the computer program run again as it's intended to run. So actually, what is, you know, victim as they're stepping through the system and seeing this corruption in the police and the judiciary, you know, insurance companies and everywhere, is to take down the names you know your case already has what a dozen names of people who were actually corrupt well if these people are not removed from the system the system will not just stay as corrupt because these bastards will recruit more people like them and they will want corrupt people because they'll have to cover their own backs so they're not going to you know suddenly um, recruit people of high integrity because that, the more nonsense they do the more dangerous that would be so Okay, we lost Catherine. System started horrible. We have to track down these bastards. And they, sadly, their careers have to be terminated for all our, our benefit. Well, I did say uh, at one point in time, a friend of mine at NSA was working in the area where they take in resumes and then they will 
uh, they'll look at him and say, okay, this guy has a, you know, he's basically got a problem with drunk driving. We're going to throw his resume out. Uh, this person has a conviction for wife beating. We're going to throw his uh, resume out. But uh, Vicky told me at one point in time, she said the orders came down from NSA security. They said, don't take any of the resumes and toss them out. No matter what the person has done, we want to see all of them. Do not pre-sort. Oh and she hey, said, say that, say that again because they, they interrupted you, Karen. They interrupted you exactly. When you, they, they said, don't take any of these resumes out. And then they interrupted you. So it must be important. Oh, well, they, yeah, I said, you know, it doesn't matter if this person has like a, a, is a child molester or a, you know, has any charges like this. We want to see all of the resumes. It doesn't matter whether they've been deemed insane or had some kind of problem with the law. We want to see them all. And that was unheard of because the, you know, usually those, her job was to give them the creme de la creme of the um, people who were applying to work there. But all of a sudden she said, I'm passing on resumes of people that I, I can't even believe they would consider hiring. She said, I had to leave the job because I was so stressed out. I had to do something else because I saw the monsters they were hiring into NSA security. You know what that is, Karen? Again, that is the cartel mm -hmm. taking down NSA through deep capture. Mm -hmm. That's what you saw. Because they, and I'm saying, they did this over a number of years, right? And they did it by putting corrupt people into our most, our systemically important institutions. And that's, you know, by the time you blew the whistle, you saw the consequences of that, you know? Well, but serial killers and pedophiles and, and these people were put into NSA in high positions. Well, it uh, seems to have really... Uh gained momentum after 9-11. I was talking to Russell Tice over lunch at one point, and he said, well, you know, after 9-11, basically uh, Hayden hired somebody, uh, L. Kemp Enzer III, to be the head of operational security. And under him, all of these psychopaths seemed to be infiltrating and be hired into NSA security because they were so afraid that um, the real story about 9-11 would leak out, and so they were basically taking draconian measures to have the nastiest people possible to shut up NSA analysts from telling them. What I've told is that I've been told by two analysts who worked at problem that they had all the information they needed six months ahead of time to stop it, and not one person had to die on September 11th. Not one, because they could have stopped it all. And then that brings us back to um, the possibility and the very likely probability that the um, upper echelon of NSA may have taken out insurance policies on the people they knew were going to be killed or counted on being killed uh, in 9-11. So that is what we would have touched on had we been able to get our guests today. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of this is just such huge disclosure about what's going on inside, inside NSA. I have one question. When you said that, you know, they were hiring all these people with criminal records and psychopaths and so forth, did they hire, him, hire them also above the level of, of the analysts, the intelligence analysts? This I don't know, that because Vicky only addressed security okay. and she left. So she did not see if it expanded from security to to hire people but i would in my opinion i would put bill black certainly as one of those people mm -hmm. um he uh just before 9 11 uh my, michael hayden was uh dernza and there was a woman who was the deputy and um during the time period which these other two analysts had told me that they knew about 9 11 she was removed from being deputy director and sent to london and that was barbara mcnamara and Bill mm -hmm. Black Jr. was brought back from retirement to be the deputy mm -hmm. while 9-11 happened. This is all on Wikipedia, I recall reading. Yeah. Well, gee, mm -hmm. why would you remove a deputy director who actually was wonderful, a wonderful person, honest, integrity, um, nobody I knew who had anything to do with her had anything uh, uh, slightly bad to say about her. They all revered her and admired her, and yet this person of integrity was removed before 9-11, during that six-month time period that um, 
I was told they had all the information they needed to stop it. And Bill Black was brought in, brought back in as deputy director. Right, to replace her. And I'll yeah, talk about, I think. Sorry. Uh, I was just remembering that uh, there was a lot of um, conversation, I think, on Twitter that Karen had at one point with Bill Black, correct? And this was right. just prior to the point at which you began to experience EMF targeting. Oh yes, directed energy weapons. Correct? Yes, I uh, at at one point in I think the fall of 2015, um, I and here's another uh, lawsuit that I'm involved with. When NSA fired me, pushed me out, um, I sued them uh, through the EEOC, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, basically did all kinds of shenanigans to try to sabotage that case. But the judge saw through it. And he said, no, I'm accepting this case. And he accepted it in January 2010. And it is still there on the dockets. It's 2017. It's still there on the dockets waiting for a time period. And we've been told, oh, we're just backed up. That I've said, basically, I think that NSA has influenced the EEOC to put my case on hold. Because in my case, I not only allege that they fired me for retaliatory purposes when I've done nothing in the world wrong, but that now they were trying to have it stall until they could end up killing me with these directed energy weapons. I think that's the plan, basically. And they have uh, threatened, coerced, or bribed the EEOC to cooperate. Corrupt court case. <laughs> Another court. <laughs> Yeah, and the EEOC mm -hmm. is the only uh, means that a person who is hired into the intelligence community has uh, for recourse. There are other methods that uh, f other federal employees can go through, but we're not eligible for that. We have to go through the EEOC and couch whatever complaint we have as discrimination. So mm -hmm. that also obviously is in deep capture because the, you know there's no way that this case um, really needs to have seven years sitting on the docket. But they don't they don't want uh, my allegations about NSA stalking and harassing me and breaking into my home to be heard. In fact, multiple times they've put in uh, requests that the judge just dismiss it summarily, meaning don't look at her evidence, don't read the brief, just decide in our favor and dismiss it because we say it's frivolous and not worthwhile therefore just believe us and dismiss it don't look at anything and that's all part of this huge cover-up about the weaponry that this weaponry is in fact being used on you and on many people you know around the country it's this desperate desire to cover up this weaponry the use of this weaponry mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting that they're doing it here to you through this court case because you, I mean, K Catherine and I were talking about this just the other day, you are an extraordinary whistleblower. Not only are you the only woman whistleblower that we know of who is speaking out about directed energy weapons, you're, the, you're pretty much the only whistleblower, period, who is speaking out about them. You know, so you represent something, and I think they know that. And uh, unfortunately for them, your whistleblowing is already out there in the public domain. Do you know what I mean? I guess they're trying to clamp it down but uh, through the courts, but we have your story, you know? We all know your story. Well, and I'm very grateful I, for you too, because if something happens, then the story stays and it, they will not have snuffed it out, you know? Mm -mm. Never. No, I Never, and I think what these people don't realize, and I keep banging on about, and I should bang on about it a bit more until they get it, is that these, I mean, the people who are doing it are in their, you know, late 60s, um, the people above them are in their 70s, um, and, um, you know, the people who actually own this entire, you know, circus, um, 70s and 80s, and those people um, do not understand the internet or modern technology in any shape or form. So they are still doing same old, same old dodgy dealings and they really don't get it. They don't get the nonlinearity of the internet because, you know, um, what's different now is in the olden day, days, they, their way of snuffing stuff out really worked, you know, but now the methods that they're using, it's like putting petrol and Semtex on the fire, you know. 
That's just what it is. And the mechanism that blows it up is the fact that the more nonsense they do, the more evidence they generate, the more people will talk about it, and the more people network. And typically, these people do not just violate one person. Because they're psychopaths, they leave a trail of people, a trail. So the only thing that you need to do is link up all these people Thing you know, you amplify um, their problems. And um, I think what we, first of all, what we should do, because this is the, um, you know, to restore justice and, and for, you know, moral and ethical reasons, is go after these people. But then there's a second um, argument, is that for our own survival, we have to go after these people. We have to go after these people. Because Just they are not human rights. It's this exactly. is just fighting for our basic human rights. You know, nobody has the right to do this to us. Nobody has the right to turn stealth weaponry upon an activist or a whistleblower or a physicist or a pastor. No one has the right to do that and get away with it, you know. Covering it up under national security and classification, these are classifications to conceal crime, as we've talked about before. And we yeah. have to go and, and that. Totally. And, and that's, you know, um, the fact that they violate our human rights and rights to life is the individual justification for it and what i would like to add is that now there's a collective justification for this because as far as i can tell the same very same corrupt individuals and their corrupt networks are also mobilized to set up pretty much world war three or something that will come close to world war three and we are now running seriously out of time we're seriously um, this this integrated weapon system is shooting out people who are trying to avert World War Three, and and this means that you know World War Three is the plan. And there are many things that indicate this in the world of finance and, and other things as well. That the business plan is to really have you know a world war whereby the U.S. and Europe are being asset stripped. Um, and the truth is, we cannot afford this world war because we um, the ecosystems are already collapsing, and that's something you can't paper over with printed money. But so that's why I'm saying it is our collective responsibility to go after these people. So it's, it's even bigger than Karen or Ramola or Millicent or myself um, or all these victims. It is a, a required for national security and national survival to go after these people because they have tentacles into much bigger corruption that's killing us all, you know. And it's not surprising that, you know, the, the some of the people who were mentioned, and maybe we'll talk about it next week, you know, also seem to have their hands in, in dodgy, again, insurance dealings, you know. It seems like there's some sort of infrastructure of crime already set up for them, because frankly, none of these people are intelligent enough to dream up these schemes themselves. So there seems to be a little, um, you know, industry, cottage, cottage industry behind them, and they seem to be networked in, you know. so. Um, Again, if, if the people who um, pulled off 9-11 took out insurances on the, the people who died that day, it again links the insurance industry to the intelligence agencies, you know. Second you know I, wish that, uh, I wish that they didn't, that they really cared that this didn't get out. But they're allowing the internet, they're allowing us to talk about it, they're allowing us to put these things together. And I would think it's their intention that we know that and we can become intimidated by their power and their span. They're in every industry. And uh, I'm not sure that there's any way that at this point, we're gonna undo that corruption. I'm not sure you can find an honest judge. Uh, certainly uh, Karen couldn't find one. She couldn't find anybody to go up and stand for her. So I don't think they care. I think they want us to know that they control this. I think they want us to know. Uh, that's why they're allowing this. They want us to know that they have these energy weapons. But you see, we're a tiny percentage. The people that are waking up, the people that have eyes to see and ears to hear, the vast majority of people think that 911 was done by a group of Arabs with box cutters. Uh, the, the majority of people. Uh, yeah, b believe that they're they're not being programmed by TV, even though they tell them they're being programmed by TV. So it's it's like we know, but the vast majority of the people who are 
who follow these systems uh, don't know how deep it is. And I'm not sure that the control system doesn't want them to know. That's why uh, this has been in the planning for a long time. And we're at the, uh, the uh, unveiling of the hierarchy, the externalization of the hierarchy. This is why they want you to know who your rulers are. And I think uh, we're getting people in the chat room asking, well, we really know that the court system is corrupt. I don't think they know how deeply it's corrupt. But they want to know what we can do about it. And uh, I've got some ideas because everything you said, Paul, I think it's an, it occurred to me as well. And it's a, it's, it's a very important thing to think through. And when we know the answer to that, we will know what to do. I think, and um, the, the way I analyzed it is as follows. I, think, I do not think for one moment that these people actually, um, actually really want us to talk about it. They don't, they really don't. I think the truth is that their entire empire is now blowing apart at a, at a rate that is accelerating. And I can prove that they don't really want us to talk about it because yesterday I had a, an interview scheduled with Richie Allen on the Richie Allen show and his router blew up two hours before I was due to come online. Then I had another chat with another person who was suffering from Morgellons, which as far as I can tell is synthetic replicating particles that he was infected with by MI5. I wanted to talk to him because he's also very poorly. My Skype was disabled. And this morning I had an interview with a Canadian radio station and my Skype was still disabled. So they're really trying hard. Right now, the reason why I've got this junk behind me is because I'm in my show inside the nuclear bunker. And if you want to know what the Swiss nuclear bunker looks like, that's the reinforced steel door here. And I had to come down here because the last couple of days, they, well, what they try to do is burn my kidney out, for example, the last two days blow my head to pieces, fry my brains. And um, I think these are such desperate measures that um, they are really, really panicking. But you are absolutely right that they are, in a sense, unveiling the hierarchy. But my gut feeling is that they are not doing it. We are doing it, I think. That's my honest, honest opinion, because they just seem so panicked and so, so, I don't know, um, helpless and cack-handed, if you know what I mean, you know? It's just so dumb what they're doing, you know? So freaking stupid, and the more they flap around, the more they discover, oh, hang on, they own YouTube, oh, hang on, they own Twitter, you know, or they own Skype, and they are, you know, messing around with that. So now we can launch court cases against Twitter and YouTube and the CEOs and say, well, you're clearly sabotaging and perverting the course of justice here. Mm, you know, go figure taking Twitter to court, you know, over, over the sabotage. So they're giving us more am ammo and they're giving us more ammo because they don't understand the internet. And so this was just circumstantial evidence, but there's, I, I can prove that they don't know what they're in for because what we're now exploring is network mathematics. These are the mathematics of complex networks. So the internet has, is still growing. People are still coming online. And the more it's growing, the more it's bunching up. And this is now the key, the mathematics describing complex networks is still just being developed. It is, we are living a phase that we cannot model mathematically because the mathematics is just being researched. So I am 100% sure that what, whatever these cartel holders own, they do not own mathematics. And frankly, they're too freaking stupid to figure it out. They're not math geniuses, you know. So I'm pretty sure they have no idea what they're in for. But one of the things I know as a systems analyst is that the networks are the most nonlinear we have. And I think that's what they're seeing. And frankly, they must be crapping themselves how quick they are going after them. You know. Can I can you guys hear me? This is Midge. Oh, can you oh hi, Midge. Yeah. hi. Can I just say a few things and go back to the, the judges? I think, yeah. you know, because I've been a way to, I have figured out a way to identify the ones that are profiting from this profit sharing program and who have been implemented into this program. So what I've been able to do is I've been able to identify my doctors and the judges and the attorneys who are part of this system. 
And I even confronted one of the attorneys face on and I showed him what I had. And I said, here you are with your name on some of these trust accounts of people that I know who are connected to my ex-husband who are his business partners. And he set me up for an interview and took my money and only gave me 12 minutes uh, of conference time and then threw his hands up in the air and said he couldn't help me. But actually what he was trying to do is he was set up to try to dissuade me from going forward. And he, um, he saw my report because I had have been scanned and I have been implanted and um, and he tried to throw me off by saying that my report, nowhere does it say that I've implanted, but it does say censors. But he, it was to throw doubt into my mind. But what I did was I called him up and I said, hey, I have you on this list. And you know, so this is what I've learned to do. And so we need to start calling out these guys, you know, systematically calling them out. And I'm, this is what needs to happen. What I'm also seeing is that there are people in high places in law enforcement who are sick of this. Okay, there are good people and they are stepping down and stepping out because I've had them call me and they have tried to give me comfort and they've tried to uh, encourage me to go forward. I have a judge who is supporting me. Um, who has told me that some of the problems are that, say with the stalking, there are no laws concerning stalking by proxy, none. And so therefore the laws have to be changed. And so she has also told me that here in Arizona, there uh, are no cases that have been successfully brought against these guys. And she's hoping that I set an unprecedented case. So I do have support. And I am very grateful to these professionals who have stepped out and to have the courage to do that. You know, so I, is, yeah, sorry. so systematically. And I too have, have uh, built up and shown the cartel, everyone that's involved, all these corporations. They also own the satellite system. They own Iridium. Uh, you know, it's all the way down the line. The cell tower companies uh, who also have the contracts with the city, with EMS, with police for, you know, their businesses. And so then you go to the FBI and then they also own, you know, their system as well. So that's how it's all connected, you see. And it's all the way down the line. And so it's the whole circle, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they also own, you're right, the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And so it's everything. It's where you go shopping, it's the grocery stores. And so they've put into place everything that you would need in order to survive and live. And then you go to the directed energy weapons. Well, they have alliances that I have uncovered. And it actually says alliance for the active denial and for all the other systems. And I have identified myself, you know, the equipment that I, that is, uh, I am being interfaced with. It's called RDO equipment. And in Latin, that means order out of chaos, which is uh, totally tied to the Illuminati. It's something that they use. It's on the dollar bill if you look at that. So it's creepy is what it is. This whole thing is creepy and it's wrong. This is amazing. <laughs> You've just bust the system wide open. I think I have in a way, yes. Wow, we have, have to have. talk to you at length and we have to publish what you have. Absolutely. Well, exactly. And so I've been trying to get this information out for a long time and I've been so frustrated because I've carried it for a long time and it's been very difficult to know what I know. And uh, when I see Karen's name specifically on, you know, trust accounts, on, uh, you know, her social security number being used, my social oh. security number being used, Victims of 9-11, their names being used to buy properties illegally. This is just such a huge, you know, disgrace to this country, to this, you know, our planet, to humanity. It's horrible. And uh, it's, it's so disgraceful and evil. I can't 
even, um, I, I lose adjectives to describe what this is, truly. Mm-hmm. And, never you know. Like you, know There's no. um, you know what, Midge, I, I this is, this is one. I just, I, I'm so passionate. It's just horrible. And when I, knowing what I know, and it's also because of who I was married to, and, you know, it's not that I, I knew I had no idea he was doing this until he turned it on me when I discovered his real estate corruption. And so that's how all this stuff started for me. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I had no idea. And, uh, and now what I know is absolutely shocking, completely shocked. Yeah. It sounds like literally every single private corporation that sustains our lives. You know, uh, this- yeah, pretty much. I mean, there are some who haven't joined these alliances. And how I discovered this is I, you know, I knew even in my hometown where I grew up, where, uh, you know, my ex-husband and I went to high school together, um, that things were happening. I had some friends that I grew up with all my life that, you know, were doing things that weren't really mean, but just different And then I heard that there were some alliances. Well, I soon discovered the alliances by city. And there were friends that I had grown up with. And, uh, you know, that it was so disturbing to see. And so after 9-11, they created these alliances by city, you know, by county, by state, um, and then by region. And they're listed under InfraGuard. If you go to our uh, sites, you'll see the alliance. Yes, and so there's these alliances, but they are, you know, on the smallest level by city, even the smallest communities. And so, um, but the, what they've done is they have merged private citizens with government entities, with corporate you know, and businesses, which is wrong. And so they're all in each other's back pockets. And then if you are outside the alliance, you cannot get any help and they do horrible things to you. And I am outside that alliance. <laughs> so, you know, but, um, you know, I've been able to spread the word and um, I have pulled up all the alliances here in Arizona by city and by county. And, uh, you know, behind a lot of this, uh, well, it's DHS, which is also ICE, which is also known as PEP. It's all the same thing. And uh, this is absolutely incredible, Midge. I absolutely want to do an interview with you and write an article immediately. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. You know, it needs to come out. I I mean, so that's how they've gotten so powerful is because they've used our social security numbers, our names. You know, can you imagine all the victims of 9-11? I took the most unusual names that nobody else on the planet would probably have. I took the five top names that I considered unusual of the 9-11 victims, and I plugged them into my search. And properties came up under their names. And that was just really horrible to see. So then from there, I went on to other people. I went on to my own family. My own grandchildren are there. My daughter. My daughter has someone a company called Property Masters of America attached to her name. So that's really hard for a mother to see. I mean, this is disgusting. Mm -hmm. And so they act like they own us in every way possible. Mm -hmm. Every way possible. You know what, Mitch, this is so powerful. And I think, um, gosh, I've got, I think, three or four things I would like to say. I mean, number one is we cannot fathom and we we normal people cannot digest this because the people who do this, they are not like us. They are not normal in the head, you know, so you have to think what these people are and what you see in their actions reflected is that they are like Hannibal Lecter. They are mentally deranged psychopaths and serial killers. That's correct. And they have been promoted up Yeah. and they have been actually groomed by entire systems. So a lot of the people who became very successful, so a lot of the billionaires, a lot of the heads of corporations, especially the bigger ones, they have been groomed as psychopaths being such to have control files on them because the truth is 
in this hierarchy there's even someone even beyond them above them who needs to control them right and um so i think that's what you're seeing you came up uh, against the lead of serial killers mm -hmm. and and they are so yeah. You know, and uh, Dr. Horton, that leads me to you because here in Arizona, there's a company called Dr. Horton Homes that is owned by my ex-husband. So see, they've taken your name. If you look at it, it is Dr. Horton. Wow. And I can I can show you that. And so they've taken our names and created these businesses. Okay. And so uh, there's a lot of there's all kinds of benefits to doing that. I was going to say, I wonder if we are part of this, you know, if they've taken our names, because this is more than identity fraud. I mean, it's beyond. Right? It is beyond. It is so beyond. So then, you know, if there's a company, you know, that has your name, your social security number, then they can get a life insurance policy, correct? Exactly. And so then they create bogus W-2s. And the only reason I know that is because that happened to me and I discovered it going through my divorce. Uh, bogus W-2s were being created uh, under one of my ex-husband's businesses. I have never worked for him in my life uh, under any of his businesses. And so, uh, but he's, he got by with it. And then they can do all kinds of things from there, turn you into the IRS, saying that you didn't claim the wages on your income taxes. But then they can also um, get you know, group insurance for their employees and claim they have more employees than what they have. So it's a whole spectrum of fraud all the way down the line. It's disgusting. Mitch, Mitch, you know, Mitch. you are the work of the FBI, you know, you are as a one man or one woman show, you know, like an FBI department dedicated to white collar crime and insurance fraud. I mean, this is amazing. Well, I, you know, yeah, I have taken it to the FBI. I went February 14th, showed them what I had, and they did not poo poo anything that I showed them. They validated everything. And I also got poisoned the day that I went to the FBI. And I told them, I said, I think I was poisoned uh, shortly before I came here. And they asked me how I thought that happened. I told him I wasn't sure, but now I know it's the drones because they can pinpoint your home very specifically using the uh, latitude and longitude of your home. And so um, I think I was poisoned that way. And then by the time I got home, I had such a bad headache. I could not remember the gate code to get into my, my, my gate to where I live. And so that was the whole purpose of it. I managed to keep it together while I was talking to the FBI. But they validated everything that I showed them. They did not poo-poo or make fun of or demean me in any way. And um, they said that I was not under police surveillance because if I was, they would not be able to talk to me. That my ex-husband has his own surveillance company is what they basically said which is DHS. And, you know, DHS, you know, that is a corporation. That is exactly a corporation. And so they're able to do all this under that corporation. They're and they have many, many businesses under that corporation. Yeah. I, I would like to, to, to say something. I would like to, to one, validate what Mitch is saying. Also, throw out what's been told to me by the person who is using me um, and is also, I guess, supposed to be a handler of search. When he was explaining to the county what, was, what he was doing to me and with me, he did say that the million dollars that he had set aside uh, from using me for research, he said, I can't give it to her now because that was fraud. And so I'll just put it in a trust. Mm -hmm. In 2000, I think it was 2002 or three. he gave me his business card. In fact, I had it laminated just yesterday. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. My goodness. And it says business property. It, it was, so it possibly she's telling me about a real estate corruption right. outfit. Right. Um, the, the other thing he said to me is that he would, put money in a savings account and a bank in my name and make it look like I was committing fraud when I got stamped. So he said he could actually put an account in my name, 
put money in it and then make me look like a fraud when I had nothing to do with any of it. Now in 2003, December 2003, and I still have the email that he sent me. In fact, it became part of my federal lawsuit. He instructed me to go to the courthouse and look up some property on a specific street. And when I got there, obviously I couldn't find it. Later he said he was showing me how quickly he could hide property that's in his name. And mm -hmm. to my faith, in 2009, I believe it was 2009, he told me that he had bought property and he told me the name of a couple of people that he bought property from, one in particular and how much he'd given him for that property. Now then in 2011, he joined the city planning commission. <laughs> And I, under, I was told then that he continued to buy people's properties. So that's, I mean, what Mitch is saying is just so real for what he's been telling me. And Mitch, I pray you can look up my name and social security number and find out what else he's using me for. But he did tell me in 2012 that he had become filthy rich selling my body. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is... One of Karen's. Karen, can you see that? No, we can't see it at all, Midge. Um, is there a, a camera icon that maybe you can press to try? Oh, you can't the see it. Okay. No, we can hear you. We can't see you. <laughs> okay. How's that? Oh, it looks like you might be coming on. Am I? You yeah. not yet. Something yeah. happened, but I think you have to press the camera icon now. <laughs> Sorry. If you move your cursor on top of the screen, you'll see the icon sort of above that little head thing. Yeah, it says, and I've pressed it, it says camera on. It says turn the camera on, and I did. Oops, there it you goes. May want, oh, may, you may want to go to settings and see if it's got okay. everything right there. Okay. Um, I don't want to do that now. I'm so afraid I'll be knocked off again. <laughs> So anyhow, so next time, but you know, uh, I have it all printed out because they do erase things. Mid, and, uh, hmm? I can tell you how to share your screen if you have something you want to show. On the okay. left side, there's a green box with a white arrow. If you click on that, it will show what's on your screen. Got it. Yeah, because I told Midge the story about getting into the Twitter fight with Bill Black, self-identified Bill Black Jr., and he tried to call me a liar to say, no, this never happened. You know, your, your, your uh, conversations with th these two analysts who told you both and in two different years, not knowing that the other had spoken with me, that uh, NSA had told them to shut up and not report anything about 9-11. And... Um, so after we got into a Twitter fight, that's when my electronic harassment started within the very same week, if not within two days, if I remember correctly. Because he was infuriated that I was saying that these two analysts had told me that they had everything they needed to stop 9-11 six months before it happened. So that he is directly tied to electronic harassment. And uh, he uh, has been found to be the beneficiary of uh, several trusts and uh, insurance policies, et cetera, et cetera. So it sounds like between your story and Midge's story, there's really a connection between 9-11, the people who died in 9-11, mm -hmm. the insurance companies, and somebody in the NSA. Well, I think it's beyond NSA. I think there's a group of upper echelon people who said, wait, wait, wait. Let's mm -hmm. not report this. What if we take out insurance policies on all these people? And oh if we gosh. let it happen, we're going to get all this money oh. and all this power. So where's the bad side for us? That's classic conspiracy. Yes. Oh. And it's all about money and greed. That's yeah, I would, I would just say to you know. Ramola, it's not classic conspiracy, it's classic business plan. Oh, yeah, right, business model, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but on a huge it. global scale, that is unbelievable. Oh and so if anyone speaks out um, on any level, then they get targeted. And so, um, 
and you know obviously we all know it's more women than men that are getting targeted and uh, you know and so I think it's what 60% is the percentage 70. and uh, and a lot of them are single yeah you know what Mitch before I forget one of the um, one of the things I would like to say is that I because I was I represented myself in court and in the UK and what you said about stalking and I know that the um, you know um, legislation around stalking is fraught with problems the the key to get around that is to um, not even call it stalking because the stalking regulation is set out for you know your local creep and maybe your local creep and his mates um, if you use stalking um, legislation, you will, you know, predictably end up in, um, you know, not it not being applicable to you. But what you should do is claim this is domestic terrorism mm -hmm. warfare, because psychological warfare and um, and you know that falls under the Geneva Conventions way to bat that out. You know, this this is it. So you are you are um, in the UK. There's harassment legislation. So you don't even have to, you know, um, it, it, it's just harassment by the, um, you know, um, the intelligence agencies, or if it's, you know, your husband's private intelligence agency is that. But even so, um, if you report it to the national um, intelligence agency, they have a statutory duty to fight terrorism. Yeah. So if your, your um, ex-husband's intelligence agency was conducting domestic terrorism, it would be the problem of the FBI to sort it out. Right. You know? And if they do not, then you can sue the FBI. Right. Um, so that's how you can get around it. So I would, I would st stay clear of stalking because it also doesn't do it justice because stalking, for example, you probably, I mean, a lot of victims have break-ins, poisonings, and so on. Yeah. And that all falls under domestic terrorism mm -hmm. around this problem. Right. Well, I, d I had been poisoned that day. I did do a hair analysis with my industrial toxicologist, uh, Dr. Staniger in LA. And it did prove that I had been poisoned that day because I did get the report and it's all a formula for cancer. Interesting. And oh my God. you said you mentioned, you've mentioned drones to the FBI and they didn't flinch. They, did they give you any information about these drones? I did not uh, say anything about the drones the day I oh. was there, but I have identified the drones. I have identified the company and uh, the equipment. And so it is that RDO equipment. And that RDO equipment is used for many things, including meiosis, which is, you know, they make your eyes red. And so that is the the key equipment that is being used along with the active denial system. And there is an alliance here in Phoenix of that active denial system of um, different businesses and people who have bought them. And so they are just the biggest bullies ever, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, uh, these cowards, they wouldn't be able to take half of what we have been, half of what we take. And so how, coward, how cowardly of them to hide behind these weapons and to hide behind this false money, their false um, empire that they have built on other people's blood and other people's names and social security. How cowardly of them. Despicably predatory. Yes. Here we go again, predator prey nation. We've turned into a predator nation that doesn't right. make money by, by um, designing and producing widgets. We're making money off of killing each other. Exactly. And, and well, I can give you some historical reference. You know, back in the burning times, in the middle of the last millennium, um, part of the purpose of the burning times and the witch trials was to relieve the women who had inherited money from their husbands of that money from their husbands. Oh, wow. So oh. To a third degree, kill them, and then the state would get their money. So this has been going on for a long time. It's just, it's, it's really perfected now. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. I mean, I've said before, this reminds me of these stories this, from really this. biblical days where there were certain towns or certain countries, certain regions that would be going through um, uh, a total lack of food or whatever, and they would actually... Uh, they were starving, and when a stranger would walk through the town, 
they would throw grappling hooks over the balconies and grab a human being and drag them up to the window, kill them, and eat them. Oh, jeez. Oh, Here we are back again in a techno dark age that yeah. essentially is doing the same thing. Uh -huh. I, I I think what we are what we are seeing, um, you know, the way I analyze it is that. Um, but what you, what you know, Karen, you saw with all these different cases, you know, that you listed, is the gradual um, capture of an entire organization. I mean, the truth is, all the intelligence agencies started off being owned by a royalty. So, if you like, they were in deep capture to start with. They never belonged to the people. But even so, you know, if you, as you hire people, there are a lot of honest people. And if you want to pull off some criminal, large-scale nonsense like the cartel does. You, you, you extend your tentacles down and your, the deep capture goes down into all the ranks. And that's what you saw. And Mitch said something like, um, you know, a lot of the good people, they, um, they try to they, um, speak to you and they come out. And that's a really good thing. But then good people also tend to quit. For example, Bill Binney and Kirk Weeby quit, you know. And that, it, it's, you know, it's understandable because sometimes you feel you don't have the power, but what it actually does is it increases the concentration of the corrupt criminals in the organization because the last remaining you know, people holding the fort are leaving, so mm -hmm. the entire power structure is left to mm -hmm. the corrupt. So there are lots of police officers leaving the police force in the UK exactly because of this. They're on Twitter saying it's so corrupt, I just couldn't work there anymore. And every single time I read this, I'm like, no, you were one of the last <laughs> honest ones. What are we going to do now, you know? Well, so, you um, also have compartmentalization. They can have an entire compartment, like DynCorp. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's plenty of uh, people who work for DynCorp that are fine, upstanding citizens, unless they're in the division that does child trafficking. And then they probably know what they're doing. Also, I'll tell you, as, a, as an organizational psychologist, they recruit for these personalities, these psychopathic personalities. Yeah. I remember several years ago, it's like probably 10 years ago now, they were looking for what they called entrepreneurs, which could run independent businesses for companies. And they wanted to find these individuals. Well, I looked through this thing, and it was I, I, the, the, the thing that occurred to me is, well, this would be really great to have this guy out there working for the corporation, but I wouldn't want him living in my neighborhood because it was a total psychopathic, driven, focused, I don't care what it takes to get ahead, blah, 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 blah. And that was uh, 10 years ago in a, a relatively uh, harmless, I mean, they weren't recruiting policemen. They were recruiting people that could run these independent things. Of course, it does help if you have a psychopath. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let, let me tell you about um, uh, something I discovered in the neighborhood in, in Tallahassee when I was there. I had someone investigated, and the investigator said, this man has had his uh, background wiped clean. And I noticed that he, his wife, and his three boys, who were uh, ages 12 and maybe 16, 17, they all would use the directed energy weapon on me when I visited a neighbor of theirs. But they were renting. They just turned up mysteriously. And they seemed to be running actually the entire neighborhood effort against me. When they would go out to their car and beep a certain way, then the neighbors around me would know to turn up the devices just an, a notch. And they would do that, you know, four or five times a day. So they were listening for this particular person to beep. But he was teaching his children mm -hmm. to kill mm -hmm. with the directed energy weapon. 12-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, and his wife. And they're on Facebook as Christians. <laughs> I almost well, you know, that's the thing. Children are being trained. Children and youth are being trained. I mean, haven't we all seen them, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. working together and pointing cell phones at us and so forth? You know, and mm -hmm. these cell phones are not just being pointed idly at us. Cell phones can be used as a weapon because you can send mm -hmm. signals through them. Mm -hmm. So happens to me pretty much every day. <laughs> I, I can actually. And yeah, I can talk about my children. I, I can confirm, having lived next to the German Federal Intelligence, that the Bundesnachrichtendienst, they, they used me as a prop. I lived about a kilometer and a half away from them, and I didn't even notice that the headquarters was there. But they used me as a prop, and I can confirm that they have several times per year, they have got children training days 
where the, the I would be stalked by, I kid you not, children, the, the age of eight. Probable deniability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But they, but they are child soldiers, which is, you know, banned. There's a UN ban on child soldiers, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, that's that's the corruption. But, um, you know, returning to the, to the courts and all this sort of stuff, um, what is amazing, and this is just so um, amazing to hear, um, Mitch, is that um, you managed to uncover a paper trail, you know, and with this paper trail, we can take them to court. Right. So what these people don't realize is that whatever you do these days, you leave a huge tape paper trail, you know, a, a, a paper trail and a digital trail. So your communications, traffic, you know, um, and the, uh, the real problem we have is right now the FBI, the NSA, and the court system is in deep capture, and therefore they do not use the powers they have to stop this criminality. So I would say what we have to do is recapture the system as quickly as possible, because once we're there and we have all, we as in the good people, humanity has access to this, mm -hmm. we can track these people down um, by midday. You know, with the power of the NSA, you can pull out who they talk to, you can, you can social graph them, you can pull out every last thing that has been going on. And, uh, you know, a historical example is the, the, the Stasi. They accumulated these files and they were super powerful, but when um, the, um, the entire system broke down and was dissolved, they panicked because suddenly they realized their archive um, um, detailed and extensive, it was actually storing a lot of dirt on them, mm -hmm. you know, and they started shredding it all in a panic. Now the good news is that they cannot shred it because these databases are across so many platforms, it is impossible to erase the information. Right. And then, you know, what else is going on is that all the cell towers are going up everywhere. And, you know, they're radiating people. So they have them at the churches. They have them in front of town council, mm -hmm. you know. And I do specifically remember uh, a conversation that my ex-husband was having with one of his business partners. And they were bragging about how they were getting away with things with the police department simply because, you know, they were radiating them, basically. And it changes everything, okay? And that's a form of, of a, a massive type of mind control and yes, it's serious it's true and so they're putting them up in, in uh, front of the town council specifically and in, in you know front of the police department the fire department you name it and this is what is happening to our country they are doing massive mind control and you know even with my own home uh, I've been and I can show people how to do this It'll show you what wave you're in, your home. Now, I've, I've been a realtor. That didn't used to happen. But you go on there now, you can see that it says beta. And, you know, that is just so odd um, to see that um, as a former realtor because, no, you know, you would never see anything like that before. But so they can switch that up. Uh, they can do that remotely. Even with the smart meters, everything is done remotely. And I do believe that uh, there's sensors in the walls of some of the newer homes that uh, they're able to engineer them mm -hmm. and so they can target people easier. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's so, it's so horrible. You know, I, if they target an elderly person and they say they have some money or they have a nice piece of property, you know, then they'll go after that person and then try to get their inheritance or their trust account or whatever the case may be. And, and so I, I know some specific facts, yeah. They're doing that and this sounds like a whole subject for separate focus, absolutely. You know, yeah. just the technology, just the neurotech that's being used. Right. There's no right. doubt, there's no doubt with these cell towers, with the Gwen Towers, mm -hmm. with the ELFs and with HARP, there's incredible mind control and brain entrainment going on. Right. There's neural tech. All of us, in fact, are being hit, you know, and this, this right. neural tech, in fact, can be so precision pointed that, you know, not only do we have child soldiers, we have children whose brains are being messed with. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, and they're putting the them. Yeah, they're talking, you know, the school districts into, you know, putting the cell towers, you know, at the schools, which should never happen. Mm -hmm. Never, ever should that happen. 
incredible. So, you know, I feel so sorry for our children. I really do. It's uh, it's a huge setup for a horrible, horrible life. Yeah, you and know, I think this is why we need to kind of pull out the stops and, you know, investigate every portion of this and talk mm -hmm. about these things. Because we need to publicize this information. People need to know. People need to hear this. You know, people need to see the connections. Because right. nobody does. We have a media that's totally defunct, absolutely yeah. corrupt, right? There's no the right. information we're getting there. Yeah. They're owned as well, and then they're threatened, yeah. you know. But also, everybody's, you know, making money. I mean, all the way down the line, I see now that, you know, um, they're making money that is this is a global profit sharing organization and so you have a police force who are making money you know in real estate that this group has uh, put this together well guess what they're going to be loyal to that that cartel to that uh, you know corruption mm -hmm. rather than to be loyal to one of us who's being targeted because they they don't want to give up their uh, pocketbook you know Mm -hmm. So, and it's just it's horrible that so many people live like that, but it's true, you know, the dollar speaks, I guess, over humanity. I, I, guess it's, I, have to, I have to jump in here and say that if you think it's about money, you're way off. This is about control. Uh, yes, I agree. The system above, uh, that is way above money. I mean, look at the, look at the Senate and the Congress and the, and the Supreme Court. They're all right. bought and they're owned. They're billionaires. Right. They're, 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 they're compromised by pedophilia, Satanism, right. cannibalism, and it all goes up to the control system above them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pervasive in society. I mean, we've got, we've got people that watch TV. Can you imagine somebody watching TV? They tell you it's programming. It was invented to talk to people who were dead. That was the original cathode ray tube. And it was originally used by Hitler to publicize the, uh, the, uh, the Olympics. It's never been anything but a brainwashing tool. And now it's so perfected, and they put so much in. Try to talk to somebody about this that watches TV. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. You can't do it because they're brainwashed. They hate you because you're bringing this up. You're ruining their parade. So, right. So they program you, and I wouldn't be surprised if things aren't inserted in your head with Hollywood movies and TV that you that you can be triggered by a word or a sigil or some kind of a symbol that's, that's splashed on there, and you'll go. I mean, that's beside Common Core in, in the school district, in the Wi-Fi in the school system. Mm -hmm. Very deep capture. I mean, you know, Catherine, when you said that, it was, it's like deep capture. And that, that, really, that really says exactly what it is. We're in all the systems that are shaped like a triangle are in deep capture, especially if they're publicly owned, publicly traded. Because, you know, that's a stock market. That's a game anyway. That's just like this, you know, trading your birth certificate and, and buying uh, uh, stocks on your, uh, on your death. Uh, it's, it's all a game for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's pretty deep capture, Gavin, I think. Well, I'd like to say something about the, the children. Look at the campuses today where people get absolutely out of their minds hysterical when a speaker from one of the other side comes and they don't want to hear them. I, ah, ah, I need my safe place. Ah, ah. Yeah. I don't want to hear mm -hmm. this word. Are you kidding me? This is not a human being. This is a... a um, a very large baby still in diapers. Right. Yeah. When you start yeah. off at kindergarten and yeah. you go all the way through universities, this is what you get. You get things that aren't actually human. Yeah. But that person is also acting for an organization that's part of the squid, right? The giant squid that's trying to crush all of our lives. Yeah. So, they don't know it. Yeah. See, they don't know it. They think they're they think they're creating a space they say, and they think that uh, uh, free speech is hate speech. So you shouldn't have that. It's so it's all... Yeah, but it's that's all so political. I mean, that's such a made-up scenario at this point, the whole hate speech thing, you know. 
Right. Truth Which, is hate speech. Yeah. But right. I think, right. you know, it's hate speech. Actually, political correctness is lying. Yes. You yes. go and you, you look at your values and facts. Um, if you're politically correct, you're a liar. Mm -hmm. And if you keep lying, you're going to play into this system because they've got you lying for a purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hate, to tell you, I hate to tell you that, but, uh, you know, if you look, go ahead. It's, you know, basically it's a, it creates self-delusion. And uh, this mm -hmm. actually can be tracked back to communist China. Mm -hmm. You know, I was actually listening to Professor Daryl Hamamoto talk about this. You, you may know him, Professor Daryl Hamamoto, University of California, I think, at Davis. He talks extensively about how our university campuses have been totally taken over. He's how a, this, isn't he a congressman or a senator? Didn't he? Uh, is he? I don't think so. I think he's, he's, he's just a professor. He's still at the University of California, yeah. I've heard his oh, okay. stuff. Jordan yeah, Peterson is another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it's it's all over America on all of our university campuses now. It's like a takeover, you know. And then look at Sweden, Sweden, and then the new Sweden, Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, they hold up signs. I'd rather be raped than racist. Oh my God! Uh, <laughs> oh, and, uh, that's that's, that's <laughs> it. So, I don't know. I, I haven't been to Europe for a while, but. Uh, it's it's the it it's it's the the yeah absolutely maybe they need a sign that says i, I, I think um you know what, in all this. i'm so sorry to ask that karen <laughs> well i um you know one of the things i wanted to say um before go ahead catherine Dr. Catherine. Oh, sorry, forgive me. Um, I think be before I forget, I wanted, to say, <laughs> I wanted to say two things. You know, everything that Mitch said about um, them putting these um, microwave towers in front of police um, stations, actually it flashed through my mind that in the UK, they upgraded the, the UK police force with a system called Tetra, if I understand it correctly. And I think Dr. Barry Tra talks about Tetra. But um, what the police officers noticed is that um, they experienced personality changes. And I think what these police officers might be um, unaware of is that the tetra frequencies are, you know, in, encapsulate um, brain interference um, capabilities, and they might have been at the mercy of, a, of an MI5 social experiment, you know, because MI5 was guinea pigging how to brain control all these police officers, you know. So that's certainly going on. And putting cell towers right next to police stations, I think, um, you know, would fit into that. Um, Actually, the other thing that people mentioned is the Wi-Fi in schools. I think that is um, getting perhaps chips, perhaps, you know, perhaps um, laden with nanotech um, children, you know, who maybe in hospital got their, um, you know, their, their vaccines and then that had nanotech in. It is conceivable that what's being um, rolled out is, a, is a, um, a brain entrainment system for the youngest in schools, you know. But Dr. Barry Trout talks about how Wi-Fi for children is deadly. It's absolutely deadly. So and he says he thinks anybody who puts Wi-Fi into schools should be shot. And he's a microwave weapon expert. You know, I think we should really listen to him. Um, and there then, is uh, a movement afoot to get Wi-Fi out of schools. There are, you know, Parents for Safe Technology and various other groups that are fighting to get Wi-Fi out of the school. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You know what, if anybody has any doubts, now that I'm down here, there's absolutely no backgrounds down here in my nuclear bunker. I do have Wi-Fi, but I think if I, this works, I can show you my measuring device. Now, meter, and I'll turn it on in a second because it will be howling. It shows you it should be it's on the green on 0 0.01 volts per meters when the wi-fi isn't on and i'm going to turn it on and just listen to it that is the wi-fi the, the amount of radiation you can maybe see it's on maximum that's six volts per meter as a point as opposed to 0 0.01 this is a factor of 600 now this level the deep red already means it's not not just not healthy it's so outrageously high it's you know insane and that's just my laptop here connecting 
over Google Hangouts to you, um, streaming video via Wi-Fi, you know? Um, so that's insane. Um, the other thing is, um, actually, we should make an entire episode because Millicent can talk about it, about how, um, you know, military personnel are trying to brain control children, you know, um, with big programs and many things, right? That's right. Um, NASA is, is, and the Air Force are identified uh, in our, uh, on the front page of our newspaper as having put in a program in the school system in my hometown, a town about 3,000 people. Um, the name of that program is STEM, S-T-E-M, which is supposed to be um, encouraging the young people to pursue careers in science, mm -hmm. engineering, and other technologies. However, we know the dangers of having NASA and the Air Force uh, among the young people, and, and I'm talking K through 12. So I, I went out, looked them up, and, and they both show up as uh, military complex. And the newspaper article actually said, this is what we get when we merge industry with education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I have STEM that comes up under my research. And mm -hmm. also what they're doing is they're offering um, ICE and DHS they're offering, um, say, if they catch someone here illegally, but they're going to school, they're in college, they will offer them a chance to stay in the U.S. if they want to join this STEM program and further their studies. Well, part of that is stalking us. Part of that is this program and so and to do the research on us. And so that's part of that STEM program, Dr. Um, Millicent Black, that you're talking about. Absolutely. And then also, you guys, you know, I don't know if you know about the SIP program that was implemented after 9-11. That is actually the COINTEL program. And the acronym is SIP. Wow. Google that. And that is the COINTEL program. And it's called SIP. Oh, my gosh. Wow. How do you this spell it? It's C I P. C I P. And then the STEM. I have a lot of. You know the STEM program. I I mm -hmm. that. Pardon? Yeah, this is. We have to get it out because this is. We have to get it out because mm -hmm. it's a bombshell. It just occurred to me that a lot of these Illuminati Freemason projects and general military intelligence complex have a sometimes a you know it's a it's a habit of psychopaths to make to make fun of their victims to denigrate them more. And one of these um, that they do is that they name their projects such that it makes fun of the victims and even the people who are doing it. You know, actually yeah. executing the problem. It occurred to me the STEM problem uh, project could it possibly be them project you know in that yeah, Dr. Robert Duncan says or the Brian Chu both say that every time they disconcert us with their stalking or their hacking on anything you know they are measuring our brain um, brain signals you know and um, and uh, I would say that the stalkers are monitored as much as we are mm -hmm. because well, why not you know you, you're watching your stalkers yeah I think the yeah. victims are. You know, a lot of the homes that uh, they live in, say the perps live in, they are owned by the corporations that I have discovered that. And I have identified the corporations that own the homes. And a lot of the um, stalkers, um, because I did a search for a friend of mine here in Arizona where he was living and he was being harassed by members of the HOA. And so, I checked out all of um, the neighbors that he was uh, claiming that were harassing him and found that every single one of them had a hospital lien against them from the same hospital and it looked like they were in created automobile accidents. So to me they were getting captured because uh, probably being offered to have their liens wiped out from the hospital if they would stalk him. And so this is happening in different ways that people are being captured, truly. And well, that's he, thing okay. with the student loan program. Oh, I was just going to say that the student loan program is another one. Absolutely. No, that happened to me. 
a, a guy's wife was in our, in our local hospital and she had to be uh, admitted, I think twice, once with surgery. And he came, I was having work done on, on my father's home and he came to me as a person who could quote unquote get cabinets for my father's home because I was getting it remodeled so that I could move him into it. And um, he took money from me and that was his payment to the hospital for his wife's death. Uh, because he never did the work. He started it, left a big mess, but he indicated that the hospital had made an agreement with him mm -hmm. or those who were working with the hospital or through the hospital made an agreement with him and his his wife's uh, hospital debts would be was, uh, dismissed if he did that to me. Mm -hmm. And I did not, that was one of the times that rapid hypnotic induction was used on me because I would not have given him money. Mm -hmm. But twice guys who were working on my father's property took money from me because I couldn't make a good decision at that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I completely back you up. I was entrapped exactly like you say, and they take over your will at that moment. I can confirm that they, they can do that. I, I, they've done it to me as well and trapped me exactly as you say. And in that moment, you don't have control over your own will. You don't feel controlled. What they do is that they prompt your brain or they shut down the, the not critical thinking faculty, but the, they shut down the ability to say no. I think I, I totally back you up. You know, when I hear all this, I, it sounds so terrifying. And, um, you know, the question is how, what are we to do as humanity? How are we going to um, recapture it? And I think I've got a couple of good news. Um, good news are fairly new um, in terms of, you know, the, the time scale that these crimes have been going on. And I think the, the um, I mean, number one, right? Actually, I have to say, Midge, um, Millicent, you two, when this is finished, both the joint heads of the FBI, because what you did <laughs> is literally, I kid you not, you know, it, it, it's amazing. You know, it is like, it's like you are doing a major investigation into the crimes of the century, flying solo, putting all together the evidence. I mean, this would be like, you know, a department of 50 people. And um, it's, it's amazing. And um, one of the things that I guess um, enabled you to do that in, on top of your intelligence, insight and integrity was also the, um, the um, you know, the, the search technology that we have today, you know, these great large databases. And that's what I was talking about earlier is that these criminals do not realize how much power we have now through the processing power. Mm -hmm and the internet that you can just search these databases and find out this information really quickly so you can you can retrieve information faster than criminals can commit crimes which mm -hmm. ultimately will you know switch over whereby we can track them down much quicker so that's good news number one mm -hmm. um good news number two is that um all of this is what we i would say what we're seeing is an entire system inversion you know it went topsy-turvy I think um, it was on stopthecrime.net that, um, you know, it said um, it's all upside down. And actually, Dr. Ronnie Kilda said it's all upside down. You know, mm -hmm. doctors are killing, teachers are making children dumber, police officers are committing crime. Mm -hmm. What's going on? And that's a classical system inversion. So you, a cartel has promoted corrupt people, the, the dross of society and serial killers, put them into the upper parts of us is controlling everything down and they imprint their own image on it. So the question is, how do you go about, you know, going out of that? And the only way you can do that is through recapture, mm -hmm. you know, um, because if you think about it, you've got one system, if it's totally captured the top, you know, the organigram, the top is entirely captured. There are only two ways to um, recapture it. Number one is an external bigger system takes it over, sucks everybody and then everything's fine. Well, when it happens on a global scale, it, it doesn't work. We can't have, we would need literally space aliens to come in and tidy this up. It doesn't work, right? We, I don't think we've got time to wait for space aliens. No, that's so the, the only other that's way. Part of the plan. Hmm? Pardon? That's part of the plan. The world war is ended by space aliens. That's part of the plan. It's been published. Right. Project Bluebeam. Bluebeam. Yeah. So that's, that's the order out of chaos. That's, that's the plan. Yeah, right. it's just that. 
right? Something tells me that those aliens will be a bunch of, you know, um, militant Freemasons, yeah. possibly. Yes, I don't think they will be. Fred, if God knows what the Dulce bases, yeah, they're going to be strange little dudes. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, so, it's, 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 a matter of, it's a matter of semantics. Yeah. And so you have to look up the definition for aliens. You know, they call uh, people from across the border aliens. <laughs> right. right. There are right. some people right. in America that they call aliens. So you have to look up the definition and know that they're talking about humans right here in the United States. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. You know, yeah. how they get a lot of these folks to do this stuff too, like the doctors and so forth and so on, is I have uncovered the funds. There is a fund. Uh, for different groups, including PERPs, uh, and it says PERPs fund, and mm -hmm. so that they're pulling from as a means of reward. So they get rewarded out of these funds for doing different things, and I have that uh, in black and white that I have researched and uncovered. And so that's how a lot of this stuff is also happening, that there are funds. And when you see like DPS fund, I mean, that is just atrocious. And, you know, for me, my name is associated with the, you know, 666 number. My new license plate for my new car came in 666. I took it back. My new credit card came in 666. My new authorization number for a new Yahoo account, they had to give me a key number, they said, was 66622. 22 is my birth date. So oh is God. that the mark, my number from the mark of the beast? So I put that into my search and all these corporations came up attached to my name, my birth date. And oh so this God. is, you know, how they're doing it. And so 666 is attached to us. Mitch, which I, you know what? Yeah. Mitch, Mitch, you know, based on what an amazing work you've done, I know you, I think what they're trying to say to you is that you are single handedly raising hell for them, you know? <laughs> well, and I have to tell you too, I've been sent a message uh, from my ex husband uh, through someone who has a radio show here who has told me that if I speak out, if I go on a radio show, that he will put me in a mental hospital. So if I wind up in one after this, you'll know why. But DHS owns their it's own mental happen. hospital. DHS owns their own mental hospital. It is a huge enterprise. And I can show all you guys that. When and I, that's the other part, psychiatry yes. and mental health, the, the, that connection. Yes, exactly. And so they have everything into place to try to discredit you. And, you know, um, my ex-husband knows that I have a gift for discovery. I do. And, um, and so I have a great intuition. And, and so he's been trying to shut that down. And, uh, and so that intuition has led me to a lot of information. Little did I know when I started on this journey three years ago that it would lead me to this. I had no clue. None whatsoever. Midge, I suspect you're going to be on a lot of radio shows. <laughs> well, I'm not going to stop. This he can do what he can. He's burned my face off so many times, you know, when you see my pictures. Uh, I wound up in the hospital. Uh, I can't tell you how many times, but the doctor did call it each time radiation burns. Uh, and that is all my diagnosis. But I want to tell everyone that, you know, each state has their own radiation regulatory agency. And that are, that's the agency we also need to be leaning on for this um, because they're not doing their job. They opened up an, an investigation for me, but I did talk to Dr. Duncan and he said, did they go out to your home where the burn occurred? And I said, no. And he said, then that is not a true investigation. And so clearly they shut the investigation down because they were being threatened, I'm sure. But uh, they're all scientists at, um, at the Arizona Radiation Regulatory Agency, which is ARA. Uh, but they, they've all been infiltrated by these corporations. Every single business entity has been infiltrated. That's for sure. This is now where we, um, I, I think, you know, um, where, the, uh, where we really have to, um, I wanted to say that the following thing, because this is, this is the, the key 
and this is the last and the biggest bit of good news I have, I guess, because there seems to be a lot of money going into paying all these corporations. You know, I mean, they they seem to be making money out of us, but someone else seems to be, um, you know, providing some the starting funds. Um, and I guess if I if I had to guess, this money comes from general fraudulent money printing that the banks are doing you know and as i said you know once you have this, this super cartel identified this is now not a conspiracy theory this is a, a systems analysis fact but um discovered by these mathematicians there is this cartel they call it the super entity it owns 40 percent of all the global companies mm -hmm. and it stands the reason that it will have bought the intelligence agencies a long time ago and open brackets it also stands the reason that it owns organized crime because organized crime is just like any other business but it doesn't, doesn't pay tax so you make at least 20 to you know 25 percent more profit on it um so we have the super entity and um it it prints all the money because it's related to the banks but also we have to remember that i think catherine austin fitz said that over the last um since the mid 90s i think 40 trillion went missing so this is 40 trillion that has been conjured into existence and then went missing from the US budgets alone. Yeah. And I think a lot of that money is ended up paying for this sort of stuff because uh, the cartel siphoned off this amount of money because it wanted to pull off something really, really big. And I think the really, really big thing they wanted to pull off is the build up to World War Three. You know, um, that's why we see, and, and if you look at it, the template seems to be one-to-one -one identical to the First and Second World War. It's like a copy and paste job. You know, we now have the death camps. We, we are all not sitting in one place called Auschwitz. We all have our individual Auschwitz, you know, at home. Um, many other things are, you know, what I identified as the Intelligenz Aktion, the, all the intellectuals are blacklisted and to be killed off. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, remember the First World War kicked off with an assassination. There were assassinations of Russian ambassadors. This entire thing is set up to be a war, uh, you know, on the surface, a war against Russia and then maybe against China, although that would be suicidal. But, you know, some, to kick off some, something big, it would be a war against Russia. I, in actual fact, the intelligence agency, the KGB is a branch office of the same entity, so it's nonsense. It's the cartel putting on a, a sock puppet show. But, and this is now the best news ever, the cartel is bankrupt. The cartel is bankrupt. Um, and that's because, and um, Karen Hudas talks about this, the cartel is bankrupt because it issued um, um, something called... Um, the Treaty of Versailles bonds. You, I think royalty. Um, it got all the gold from royalty and then you know um, states and issued Treaty of Versailles bonds in return. And then people forgot about the Treaty of Versailles bonds. However, they have been accruing interest, and the the value on the Treaty of Versailles bonds. Um, so, in other words, what the the banking cartel owns, the governments and royalty, is bigger then nation state debt, so national debt. So the fact it means that the cartel is bankrupt. Um, and, and whoever calls in these treaty of Versailles bonds will wind down the cartel. Now of course this is the, the, the pay this is now you know a news from finance and Karen Hudas talks about this. But then um, the I, the question is how do you enforce this? And um, this is now the second bit of really important information. Um, and it hangs together with, I was banging on about the, the prodigies dying. And I, I think every single one of them worked on something behind the scenes that was hugely important and they died. Um, one of the people to die was John Nash. Now I can't prove this, but I've got the gut feeling that the reason why he died is because of a piece of work he did um, for the, I think it's the National War College. Um, and what this is, is a, is a huge game theory um, simulation um that works out how coalitions form and it it, it what it showed is that the banking cartel uh, is to be wound down it that's what it showed so if you if you listen to karen hudas she she bangs on about um this um uh, she calls it the power transition model and what she gives in documentation is is far too low tech for what she actually talks about so it shows me as a you know as a physicist that there's somewhere a big kick-ass simulation under the bonnet 
and the people at the World Bank use maybe a, an interface, you know, some low tech thing, but there's actually big brains powering this thing. Now, the reason why I'm saying I'm suspecting that John Nash was behind this is because everything I understand from the power transition model was exactly what he not just worked on, what he developed. Okay. And then this guy dies, and he died in this car accident. You know, um, I think a taxi, his taxi was hit. He and his wife weren't, um, weren't wearing seat belts, and you know, they flew out of the car. The driver had minor injuries and so on. And they were hit by another car. Now, being hit on the corner by another car is a classic intelligence agency um, job because all you have to do is ensure that the seat belts are not working. And as soon as um, you hit the car, and especially if it's head-on collision, so you've got in physics center of mass, you know, you maximize the energy you put into the collision. So at very low speeds, you can eject somebody out, make them, you know, fly out of the car. Especially if you hit the car on the edge, you um, add in a rotation so these people fly through the window. Um, and then they are injured and then you can finish them off in hospital, you know, or at the scene. So it's a, it's a classic intelligence agency job. And the key is that Neither he nor his wife were wearing their seatbelts. That's what I heard. Now, John Nash is, was a generationally defining genius. He will know basic physics, and he will know that after about 20 miles per hour, you, can't, you don't have enough physical force to hold yourself. So there's no way on God's earth that you know, a genius will climb into a, you know, with a taxi driver. I mean, if you're a genius, everybody else around you is a gibbering moron, right? So there's no way a genius will be trusting a gibbering moron taxi driver to drive him, and especially his wife, safely anywhere. So I think John Nash was murdered. And the timing of his death, and Karen Hood is starting to talk about this power transition model, is hugely important because they started talking about this power, power transition model. John Nash died, and I think it's because it's powered by his brains and his work. And had he gone public once, and said, oh yeah, I worked on this, it would have led to the biggest capital flight out of the network of global corporate control ever in the history of mankind. Because he managed to use mathematics to prove that this will be the end result of the system, this power transition model. At 95% confidence level, the banking cartel will be wound down. This is, to anybody who hasn't heard about this, it sounds like I'm talking gibberish, but this is the biggest the biggest, most important piece of information we have, really. What is it? Sorry. Just a little insertion, just minor. John Nash was targeted during his entire lifetime. He was uh, labeled a paranoid schizophrenic. He was committed several times. You know, if you've all seen A Beautiful Mind, the whole story, the mystique is that this was a schizophrenic and a genius, you know, and schizophrenics are often geniuses. The, the whole story behind it. But if you look through and read his story, it seems very much like he was completely targeted um, for, his, for his genius, you know, mm -hmm. and um, labeled. And they were trying to shut him up at various levels. Absolutely. And I think it's because it stands to reason that once you've got, you know, these um, captured and Nazi scientists in, uh, in the CIA, you, um, you know, not just there, but um, you have these Nazi scientists and you've got this genius, well, they will want to run the experiments on him. So yeah, I think he was experimented on his entire life, you know. Possible. And I, I would, I'm 100% sure. It's too many coincidences, you know. It just doesn't, mathematically, it just doesn't tally. But I, I think, so I would think all this about him being schizophrenic, well, yeah, you know, especially as targeted people, we know what that means, right, most yeah, likely. Yeah. So, you true. know. And um, I think he flagged up as a genius very early on, so he would have been experimented on very early on. But um, the, the key is to realize that if, if had John Nash gone public and said, you know what, it's, it's my work, no one on the planet would have doubted the, uh, the validity of it. And what it is saying is that the banking cartel is being wound down, so everybody who's got a stake, because there are people who have you know, shares and so on in the corporations, they would also be liable for the debts of this entity. And that's why it would have led to the biggest you know, a capital flight. So to shut him up, I, I'm 100% sure they killed him to shut him up. Because if he had said that by midday, the banking cartel would have been, you know, history. And I think, um, well, you know, even if, it, if I'm wrong and then John Nash was not involved, um, 
Matt Karen Huda says that this power transition model has been shown to be right in every single time they, they tested it, every single time. And that means there's something really kick ass. Something, some big brains worked on this. And she says they were modeling countries and you know um, different um, transitions in countries. And every single time the, the experts and the um, analysts disagreed with the power transition model, the power transition model was right. Um, and, and you know, John Nash was into game theory and all this sort of stuff and, and many, many other things. And uh, he would have understood networks. He would have understood complex systems, um, you know, within a second. So I think, I think that's, that's the answer. The truth is we are now in this transition and John Nash, if he were around, he could tell us that we are going to win. Karen, Karen. We are going Karen, to win. Catherine, how would that look in the real world? How would that play out if uh, all the banksters all of a sudden became deeply indebted? Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, and, and I think this is de facto already the case. Now the way it would look is that we would see um, a, a large number of assassinations um, to do in banking and the large number of assassinations would be most likely people who have access to the databases. So it would be the, um, the CTOs, the technical um, you know, um, um, directors of, uh, of the banks. And if I'm, I, I'm, I haven't looked much into it, but I think that's, that's what we saw. Do you remember all these bankers just hurling themselves out of windows? And what was so curious is that a very large number of them were the CTOs. So those are the people who've got access to the databases, right? And the reason why that would be the case is because, um, you know, in all these complex structures, people would want to have access and figure out, okay, how are we going to dismantle this big, you know, behemoth, the octopus. So you want to have access to the databases. And so if you kill off your CTOs, you, you, you know, deprive people of that. And maybe the CTOs were working with, you know, who knows, in police forces, intelligence agencies trying to wind us down. So I would say that's another bit of, um, you know, circumstantial evidence because it was just so curious. You know, you had these bankers who would just give themselves a blow to the back of the head, then would shoot themselves into the back of the head if they were left-handed on the right-hand side. And after, you know, the, the bullet left a dent in the floor when it ricocheted, they would grab themselves and hurl, hurl themselves out of the window. You know, so it was those sort of banker deaths. And we saw about, I think the last count was 80 or it was, it just kept going up and up and up, you know? And it's, it was the, the positions these people ha held that is key. Um, and I think that's indication number one. Um, you would also see um, uh, the, the, the real question, Paul, is um, this, is the this is like circumstantial evidence that this might be the case. But now the question for humanity is um, what it will look in the, the entirety of the transition. And I think this is why it's such a really bad thing that John Nash and, and people who could have replaced him like Aaron Schwartz um, died, were died. Um, it's because we need those geniuses to ensure system stability. We need people who can understand complex systems and stabilize it because it is the biggest rejiggling in the history of mankind. And it will lead to huge shear forces in the system, huge nonlinearities, as in for the elites murder the elites will start killing each other because it's the biggest, you know, I mean, killing little people like us has got no benefit, but killing each other will be the, the biggest payoff ever because um, you can make more money than ever in the history of mankind doing that. So the incentives to, for billionaires to, and, and trillionaires to kill each other is, is like is super big. So you would expect that a lot of them would be fleeing to um, remote locations and into underground caverns. Didn't, didn't we see something like that? you know, about rich people disappearing and not being found for a surprisingly long time. Well, that's what you would see um, and many other things. But you would also see uh, just an onset of insanity and you would also see the cartel pulling off the last thing it has up its sleeve, which is to stage World War Three to paper over all of this. As in World War Three, you could kill everybody who knows about this. You could destroy the databases. You could bomb the warehouses where the databases are stored. Uh, you know, you could do, introduce the big chaos and paper over it. And I think we see exactly that. We see the build up to World War III. And this is why I'm saying what we guys are doing right now is we are avoiding World War III because the direct energy weapons are owned by the cartel, as, as Mitch has mapped out in detail. You know, they own the companies. Um, 
And I think this directed energy weapon system is being used to, to try to kill off absolutely everybody who tries to move against the cartel. That's how they are trying to stabilize it. But I just want to say to them that by now, I mean, I can't be the only person who's figured this out from listening to Karen, uh, Karen Hulis, you know. So I think pretty much the billionaires and trillionaires who've got access to much more detailed information than I have, have figured this out. So um, it will not. It will not pay for them to stage World War Three because none of us will survive this, number one. And if they wanted to pull off World War Three, the incentives would be even, even higher for the, you know, trillionaires and billionaires around them to kill them, you know, because they wouldn't even do a good deed. So, you know, Paul, when we, we looked at deep caption in these organigrams and we said that you get this layer of psychopaths, you know, accumulating at the top so that you've got this thick layer of just psychopaths. Well, that's the key. So, in a sense, the elites have to support us ladies if they want to survive, as ironic as that sounds, because we are trying to stop this. We could have a civilized solution, court cases, we shut this down in a civilized manner, we cycle the system, no one dies, and most people can keep their wealth, pretty much, you know, but we get to a more stable system. Um, they wouldn't have as much control, but they would have a lot of wealth. Um, if they don't do that, what will happen is that we have the top psychopaths and they are surrounded by a very thick layer of, of murdering, serial killing psychopaths who have the biggest incentive in the history of mankind to kill Mr. Big. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, it's not a comfortable position to be in, you know? Yeah, it's a Game of Thrones. You know, you all know when it comes down to just the snakes. The snakes will kill one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is interesting. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how much credibility I give Karen Hudes. I know her husband works for, uh, he's designed uh, financial systems for the elite. So I don't know. And she, she also pointed to at one time, I don't know whether she still does this, Karen, that we're controlled by uh, Homo carpensis. Oh, yes, the cone heads. You know what? I someone raised it and I just said, We're not controlled. It was Ed, Ed Spencer who said, Oh, yeah, we're controlled by cone heads. No, we're controlled by dickheads. You know, <laughs> 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 that's perfect. You know, that's perfect. Like, with all of them, you know, works for me. Yeah, them cone heads. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think she also no. said that she also said she corrected herself in one interview and she said a disinformation agent got to her. And she was quite honest and she said, You know, I, a disinfo agent really brainwashed me into it. And um, and I, I can totally see how that happens because we have been tricked and you know um, led led astray by disinformation agents. Um, but the other thing is also that shows you how important she is. Um, that in August she was um, hit by directed energy weapons, and she was hit simultaneously with uh, I think a lady who took care of um, her and and uh, a man who was working with her or simultaneously hit by by dues and they all had stroke-like symptoms and you can see that you know you can see Karen before the attack and after the attack because she has these weekly or you know um, shows every two weeks and you can see the effect but she says her doctor said it was not a stroke they couldn't find it so and she identified General Dumford as the person who did that um, or was responsible for this and she keeps talking about it you know and she says General Dunford is an agent of the banking cartel and he did that so she's extremely public about it and the fact that they did that I think shows that um, Karen is really the um, the the, uh, the stumbling block for them but it's it helps to know that Karen has the support as she says of Russia and Japan and if you want to understand why Russia and Japan would be backing Karen is because World War Three would be trying to draw in Russia. You know, we've got this like, um, what's it called, the, the Star Wars this defense system, you know, this missile defense system. And, and Putin was making the point that, okay, you've got these missiles, but within minutes you can um, put um, nuclear warheads on them, and then you can rain down missiles on Russia. We can't let that happen, you know, but this system isn't in place. Um, so Russia has an interest in stabilizing the system. Japan has an interest in stabilizing the system because as soon as the U.S. is not, um, you know, fulfilling its duty to protect Japan against, for example, China, they can be just taken over as a business plan. Mm -hmm. um, so Karen Hudis is right now our only chance to avoid World War III because she's the person who has the full backing of, of Japan and, and Russia. And she is, as I understand it, 
the signatory to the US shares in the global debt facility, which is this big, huge stash of gold and wealth and assets. I think originally owned by the Vatican and they now don't own it anymore. Legally, they are not um, entitled to it. So that's the truth. You have her on, wouldn't it, to ask her to come on the forum one time and uh, explain this. Because this is uh, totally new to me and it's good news. It's really it, good. It is good news. It, but it took me, you know what, it took me. Uh, the reason why I got into it is because I studied complex human systems and finance was one of the things I looked into. When I first came across um, Karen's work, I thought that just sounds so crazy. And then she produced all these um, documents and she said, no, I can prove all this. These trusts exist. And when you look at the trusts, they all have code names like, you know, white wonder boy and, you know, holy father in heaven and, you know, the most amazing what's it. And I thought that sounds like a bunch of psychopaths. You know, it's what the English would call batshit crazy. And I thought, hang on, it must be true. It must be true because he's talking about the top of the pyramid and they're all freaking, you know, messed in the head. So, yeah, that's what they would sound like, you know. And that's what they really sound like on paper, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but please have her on because I think the shit's real, you know. This is real. And she's a TI. And, and frankly, uh, well, what she's working on is she's saying we have to replace our paper currencies. And that's, this is how I'm tying it to what, you know, I, sorry, I launched it. It's so important. Midge was saying that, you know, all these corporations and they have all this money and these extra pools of money to um, pay the perps. Mm -hmm. And Karen says we have to switch off this money printing. And she's working on um, the, the global currency reset to put all our currencies onto an actual gold backing. And as I understand it, the plan is to give actual gold, um, seal it inside the currency. Mm -hmm. So it will feel like paper, but it will have in term in a flexible plastic encasing, it will actually have gold dust of the value of the currency. Uh -huh. And you could do spectroscopy or whatever you do on the, on the notes. So every mm -hmm. person could check that the amount of gold that's on the papers is in it. You're holding it in your hand. You know, it's not digital. Yeah. Look, we're going to have to end. Uh, this is great. And I, you know, I, I'm really uh, kind of upset because we don't have a big enough platform for this. Uh, you guys were uncovering some amazing stuff and drawing some lines and connecting some dots that everybody needs to know about. I, I don't know how to get this out any more than just to our channel. That, if, you, if you're watching this and uh, you can get this out on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, okay. I think that this needs to go public. This is what people need to watch rather than TV or, uh, or read the newspaper. This is really what's happening. And uh, I just want to sign off and say thank you very much, panel. And so, oh, I wanted to, uh, we had somebody in the chat that wants to get rid of Midge. Uh, okay. Gotta get rid of Midge. <laughs> Get rid of me. Touch with Midge. <laughs> so if you have a way to get in touch with you. Uh, you could say it now, or we could put it below uh, in the show notes. Uh, I can give out my email address. Okay. It's y a y a Mathis. Karen was supposed to have had you all keep at yahoo.com the other day. She said she was telling you. So it's y a y a Mathis m a t h i s at yahoo dot com. Yes. So uh -huh. anybody who wants to get in touch with her, uh, anybody can get in touch with anybody on the on the panel by contacting Utopia at gmail dot com or any of their emails that are publicly available through their websites, and they'll be listed below. So if we have any sign off con. Uh, content or anything to say? I just want to say one thing. Midge, I want to interview you before anyone else gets to you. Okay. <laughs> and I want actually to talk to Karen and you together okay. to talk about 9-11 in particular and yes. policies with 9-11 because that's a blockbuster story for America. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Yeah. And I really, really would like both of you to talk about that. That would That'd be huge. Be 
Okay. And really, so we have to talk pretty much immediately after the show, because I think I, we need to put you on a separate podcast and get your story out there immediately. You know, okay. from inside the camp, from within our ranks, really, okay. before the big radio shows get you, which they're okay. going to do. I mean, of course, you're, you're going to be on national TV before you know it. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I hope, I hope. And Catherine, I want to talk to you separately as well about the whole Karen Hooters thing, you know, the whole story, the financial story. So we have to just get working on this immediately. I'm beginning to realize there's a huge urgency to this. We've got to get going. I, I agree. I feel that urgency every day, you know, from mm -hmm. what I know, from what I know. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want you guys to know that I do validate my research in many uh, ways. I triple check it. But I also validated against what I know with my ex and his corporations. And so the research that I'm doing in different states, when I pull up his information, I know I'm on the right track. And so it's not just one state that our names are being used in our social security numbers. It's across the board, okay? It's all, it's everywhere. Yeah. So I just wanted to let you guys know that. And then knowing that the FBI did validate what I was showing them, so. Yeah, fabulous. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. Okay, Paul. thank you so much, Dr. Mark. Paul. Yeah. Before before we hang up, let me just also validate Mitch on the 666 uh, license plate. I was fourth to drive 666 license plate on my car for the first two years of my of the high tech torture. So from 2003 to 2005, they would not let me change that type license plate. Wow. Okay. But that's from the transportation department. Uh, 666 is the identification number for transportation, believe it or not. Wow. Yes, exactly. You know, that needs a banner headline by itself. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Marco. You bet. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.